The NTSB preliminary report is out on that UPS plane crash in Louisville, Kentucky in early November 2025, you might recall, as it crashed upon takeoff. And they provided us with some newer security camera screenshots that have higher resolution photos that show us clearly what happened with the engine falling off. I enhanced some of these photos for us. And they also released photos of some of the parts that went bad. So we're going to examine them today and figure out what went wrong. Okay, so today, the NTSB finally released some much better improved higher resolution photos. These are screenshots taken from the security camera at the airport runway that shows us everything that was going on when that plane was trying to take off. So let's take a look at it. It's a lot clearer and it shows the engine falling off of the plane. So here's the picture that the NTSB gave us today. Now I had to enhance it. I had boosted up the contrast and brightness and saturation and made it a little bit more colorful and easier to see. So they gave us a sequence of six photos and I wanna go through them one by one. So this is something the news hasn't done yet for us because all they were worried about was just getting the headline out. But I wanted to show you something here. So here is the UPS plane getting ready to take off. Now what's interesting here is that Everything looks okay as the nose is lifting, which I thought the problem actually started earlier, but everything looks okay until the nose lifts off the ground, which is now you're at VR speed. This is, you know, rotate, the, rotate the nose upward. And I can't quite tell if the rear wheels are still on the runway or not at this point. But anyway, it does look like there was no problem going on here in frame one. Let's go look at frame two of six. And then right here, here's where you see the first bit of problem. You see that? Uh-oh, Houston, we've got a problem. Because what we're looking at here is, see, here's your rear pylon. And I don't even see the, the cowling around it, the, you know, the protective metal that you see, the sheet metal. Or, or if that's the way it normally is, it's just, it's so blurry, I can't really tell what's going on there. But what we know, the rear end of it is now pointing downward, and it used to be attached onto the back part of the wing. So you could see the difference between engine one over here on the left wing and engine three over here on the right wing, which you could see how it's sort of aimed, it's almost level. And this engine's pointing straight up because it is now, it's probably just hanging by the wing clevis and uh, the little pin that goes through and everything on through those lugs. And, and maybe this is just about to break itself. And then there's engine two, looks okay. Let's go to frame number three now that they gave us. And the frame number three, now you can see what's really going on. Look at this. And I'm surprised that the engine popped up this high. I actually would have expected the engine would have dropped down. So I don't know what made it go shooting upward, except maybe a little pressure blast here. Maybe it's acting like a rocket now. I don't know. But we can see it looks like it's there's probably debris and stuff getting sucked into engine number two at this current time. The NTSB did not tell us yet whether or not engine two was functioning at this time or not. So that will probably come out in the final report. So let's go to frame number four. Just make sure we have what we see here. Everything is going on. The, there's your right engine. Here's your left engine. And it was hanging right here on the left wing. So let's go to frame four. And now you can see it's much more violent here. You can really get a clearer image as to what really happened here. And this is just unbelievable because here you can see how high the engine has shot off of the wing, which is just amazing. And it's on fire too, as well as the wing has all ignited up now. And I'm really surprised that the, the plane just didn't explode at this point because of all of that fuel there. And so by this time now, you can see the rear wheels are already off the runway. Now, now some of you who are not as informed about like what happens with flights, and you're probably wondering, why didn't they stop the plane at this point? Why didn't they drop the nose back down and go back down? Well, they can't, because once you reach that V1 decision speed, you're committed. That nose is going to lift up a couple of seconds later. It's called the V rotate speed, you know, the VR, the rotation speed. That nose has to go up 
because if it doesn't, you're going to run out of runway space and you're just going to crash and explode at the end of the runway anyway. So as I showed you before in my previous video, this is the slide I made to illustrate to you how at V1 speed, the certain speed that you're going down the runway, you have to make that decision that you're going to lift off. And the nose will lift up here at the VR, which is rotation speed. So the nose rotates upward. And this is about the position that the plane was in when we saw the, the flames started to come out of the engine as the engine separated. And then of course your V2 takeoff safety speed comes seconds later. And then here's a UPS plane, just normal, just so you can see uh, the picture of what it looks like. Uh, the engine attaches here to the pylon, and both are attached to the underside of the wing. So your safest option, nine times out of ten, is to just get up in the air, try to deal with the situation, and turn around and land. Okay, so let's go check out frame number five. So here is frame number five, and then if you look floating above the middle part of the plane, you can see the engine floating there, and I believe it's like upside down. So going back to frame four, see, you can see it's all on fire there and flaming, and I believe maybe momentarily those flames might have gone out, or maybe the engine is twisting and tumbling so that it's pointing the fire side away from us, but you can still see the smoke up above the engine up there, and some other flames look like down near the the plane itself above the plane so it's a little bit hard to tell it's a little bit fuzzy there and then of course all the smoke behind it and sure enough that's what we saw in that video taken from the the two airport employees that were driving in that vehicle there and, and were shooting it through the front window of their vehicle it was kind of shaky and a little bit out of focus but you, you get the idea of what was happening so this is what was happening during that time and now you could see it of course much more clearer than in any of the videos we've seen before at the airport and so here we are now on frame number six and you can see what the plane is doing now it's you know this is what barely 10 15 feet off the ground at the back wheels the front wheels look like they're maybe 20 or 30 feet off of the ground and then showing the the route that the plane took when it crashed it lifted off of out of the runway here got maybe 30 feet in the air and it started to rotate and curve over to the left where the left landing gear struck the roof of this ups warehouse and then the plane started to come and crashing across all of this area here and this is where we saw that famous viral video that i showed you of the man's truck with the dash cam that captured the plane flying right across the street here and crashing into the tanks and exploding and it just came right across this whole area here and then here is the how the engine attaches to the pylon like i've showed you before on uh, on other crashes as well but uh the the engine attaches to the pylon and the pylon attaches to the underside of the wing at two points through the rear set of lugs and then the forward set of lugs into the wing clevis and then, of course, many of you have seen this photo. I also showed it on my last two videos here on the UPS plane crash. But it shows the engine with the pylon fairly well intact, sitting there on the swale there. Probably, I think that was on the right side of the runway, down the direction that the plane was traveling. So it sort of bounced around, flipped around, and then landed off to the right. And it's a good thing that it landed there and not maybe somewhere else in the warehouses where it might have been lost or pieces of it would have been lost because they found the crucial pieces here doing what's called a FOD walk. That's F-O-D, which means foreign object or debris on the runway. And they fan out with a bunch of guys and they just start searching for it and they use metal detectors and stuff like that. Probably those magnet things that pick up anything that's metallic also. And so remember, this NTSB preliminary report is not a final report. They don't give a root cause. What they are showing us is this is what we know so far. And they have found some parts that are broken and had metal fatigue and cracks on them and overstress cracks. And they are showing those parts to us here in this report. So let's take a look at what they found. Okay, so here's some more of the pictures they released. And again, I also enhanced this one to bring out some more of the color saturation and everything. It wasn't a very good shot because they were shooting into the bright sunset. And then, of course, the bright flames here are going to overpower the CCD in, in, in any security camera and I believe this might be after it had already struck the roof of the warehouse because you can see that the plane is banking left the left wingtip is down so I believe that this was taken just a few seconds before it went across this street back over here in front of that man's dash cam which I showed you earlier 
Okay, now they also released this map right here that gave us the time stamps of where the plane was and everything and when it took off. So when you look here, so position one happened at about 5.12 p.m. in 44 seconds. So that was back here when they started rolling. And then the final ending of the crash here was just about 60 seconds later ended up here in position 10. So it's kind of, you look at this and you go, man, these guys never had a chance. And who would know that you're sitting back here? Who would know that 60 seconds later from now, you're going to be dead? There's no time to say goodbye to anybody. There's no time to plan your finances. You're alive here. You're dead here. 60 seconds later, no clue. Here they showed an aerial view of the damage path. And it shows, see, the runway was over here on the upper left. And so the plane was taking off this way and veered to the left. And you could see how the landing gear curved just a big cutout out of the, the top of that UPS building there. And I don't know if anybody got hurt in there. I know that there was a, an additional 23 people or so on the ground that were hurt. But the plane crashed across the street here into these tanks. And the entire crash site was 3,000 feet long. So now I'm going to show you exactly where the parts were because they got the pictures of them coming up here. And so the way the engine attaches to the pylon on the wing, which I've showed you before, is right here. And so now they have an enlarged view of the pylon right here. And on the pylon, these are the two points that connect to the wing. See, there's a, a forward part and there is an aft part. And so what they did was they zoomed in on this aft part on this drawing to show you the way it works. So you see how you get this eyelid? You see how you have like this eye right here? This is a boring hole where the pins go through to attach it to the wing, onto this wing clevis right here. So there's two lugs, as you can see here in the picture, and then in the blow up, yet they're side by side against each other. There's an aft lug that you see in the green, and there's a forward lug that you see right here on the yellow and then in the middle is a spherical bearing and so in here the bolt goes through here and passes through all four sections of metal and that's how it attaches on the rear and then in the front part of the pylon right here there's two vertical bore holes each has their own spherical bearing as well with a bolt that goes through that connects it on to the forward wing clevis and the same thing here you have bolts that go through there so this is the two main attachment points for your engine pylon and this is what broke so here they're showing us what they call an exemplar photo and this is supposed to be representative of what it would look like in normal airplanes however i believe this is one that they brought in for service and probably found cracks because this looks to me like fatigue cracks around the boring hole where the bolt goes in. See, remember, here's your aft lug that I showed you on the drawing before, and then here's the forward lug. And then this big section here and the other section here on the right are the wing clevis. And so the bolt goes through all four of these parts and then the nut on the other side. So this is how this whole apparatus connects up. And this looks like a crack right here too, you see? So this is why I think this, when they say exemplar, I believe it just means it's a sample one and this particular sample had fatigue cracks on it also and that's what they look for. Okay, so this is not the plane that crashed. This is a sample of what this failure mode might look like. Okay, so next in the report, uh, the NTSB showed us this. So this is the aft end of the engine pylon and so they zoomed into it and you can see just how badly damaged here that both the forward lug and the aft lug were so this is where the pylon would be facing forward the front end of the wing and this is the very back end of the pylon where these two connect and that spherical bearing goes right inside here so this is the left wing i believe flipped upside down and they're looking at the wing clevis right here and as i showed you before right here in the middle of it is where those two lugs the aft lug and the forward lug were supposed to go and then this spherical bearing goes right through those two and in fact here's a picture off to the right of what a good spherical bearing is supposed to look like and you look at this and you go oh man this thing looks like it sh it sheared itself it it shredded it just ate itself up so we don't know if this spherical bearing here caused those cracks 
that are in the uh, forward and the aft lug, but we know that they were right here and they broke, they broke off. And so we don't know if they broke the bearing or if the bearing broke them, but the NTSB will determine that. And so here's where the NTSB made this sort of a composite gallery photo to show you how those three sections connect together. So here's the two broken pieces off of the lug. So see, it should have been one continuous eye round. And then this eye round here is supposed to go right in here, okay, with the spherical bearing passing through it, holding it in place. And then the bolt goes right through here and the nut here. So, so this right here is your ruined spherical bearing. And then they took all of the parts out and showed us there's the bearing and there's the collar around the bearing. And so that's the part that ripped up. And I really can't tell the condition of the bearing, like if it was broken on the other side or anything or not. But the bolts seem to have held up pretty good, as well as the washers and the nuts. And it's amazing they found all these parts in that big old 3,000 foot long debris field. Although my guess is it was still attached to the pylon or part of the wing. I imagine they found this part from the scorched crash and they found this part on the runway. That would be my guess. Okay, now one of the problems here is that what they mentioned here is that there was some maintenance performed on this pylon. And it says a special detailed inspection of the left pylon lugs would have been due at 29,000 cycles. So that's way in the future from now, actually. Because if you look, see, there's 21,000 cycles is what's on the plane right now. So that much wasn't really due. However, they did do some maintenance in October where they did some lubrication on it. So I believe that the FAA is going to look at these cycles here and say, you know what, are we requiring these planes to be checked at a decent enough interval or should we shorten that time frame to be safer? What's interesting here is that they did do a lubrication task of the pylon thrust links and the pylon spherical bearings on October 18th, just a couple of weeks before the crash. And of course, in the report, they talked about these similar events, and this is the crash you heard me mention on my last video, that American Airlines Flight 191 back in 1979, that's the flight that made me afraid to go flying for years after that. Because man, the thought of that engine falling off, and you could see that now famous picture of the plane crashing after the engine had fallen off. But that was caused by maintenance error when somebody with a forklift bumped into the engine because they were trying to save 200 man hours and doing the repair incorrectly. That probably did not happen here. And the crew experience does not seem to be an issue here because, because the captain monitoring had a certificate with the typewriting for the MD-11. So he had 8,600 total hours and 4,900 that were in this particular plane. And then the first officer here, he also had the same license and... He had 9,200 hours of flight experience, of which 994 hours were in this plane. And then the relief officer here, um, same thing. He was fully licensed and had 15,000 total hours of experience, of which 8,000 were in this plane. So as far as we know, three experienced pilots, and there was no evidence that I could see that they did anything wrong. These guys just, these guys just simply had no chance of recovering from this. And the reason for this is because when you have a plane failure like this, I believe two of the engines had failed. And this plane needs two engines to get off the ground. And with only one engine, not only will you very likely not get off the ground, but if you do, you're going to come right back down. That's the problem. So with that aircraft maintenance being done for about six weeks throughout September and October, it does make me wonder, hmm, did something happen maybe? You know, did somebody inadvertently bump into the engine? just like they did on the American Airlines Flight 191 back in 1979, where the forklift bumped into the engine, which caused some breakage at the back point where that pylon attaches to the clevis. It's almost in the exact same place. So the FAA would made the smart decision to ground all of these planes until they can all get checked. And if you missed my last two videos here on the UPS plane crash, make sure you check these out here too, because I had some great stuff on there for you. And I'll keep you up to date as the NTSB releases more information for us. So thank you for joining us and we'll see all of you on the next one.